I recently posted a video in Texas where a co-author of mine, uh, Dylan Airy, and I, we went around with the flat earther, saw some of his experiments, how he tried to prove that the earth is flat and everything, and if you haven't seen the video, you can check up there and watch it, but it's not necessary for what I'm going to do here. So normally in my channel, I'd like to talk to people with all kinds of different opinions and not be there with the purpose of just proving them wrong. But there's been enough of a call for more details as to why this experiment wasn't correct that we figured we're going to just do a whole video explaining some of the reasons why we know Earth is round. It's actually a bit more subtle than you might think. You know, science is a very messy thing. It's not a static body of knowledge and there's a lot of trickiness to it. And we're going to further debunk, you know, why it is that these experiments don't work. So Dylan is back in Princeton and I'm in Poznan right now. So we're going to do a call online and get into some of the details of this later. I've literally been wandering around town for more than a half hour to look for a shadow to demonstrate my point. Poland in August isn't necessarily very summer-like sometimes. So the first person to estimate the radius of the Earth was Erisanthenes around 2300 years ago. And the way he did this is he put two rods in the Egyptian cities of Alexandria and Aswan. And he looked at the summer solstice, he looked at the distance cast by the shadows, and measured the distance between the two cities and was able to arrive at an estimate from this. More recently, in 1870, Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-founded modern evolutionary theory, did an experiment at the Old Bedford River in the UK. Now, it's a river. It's uh, six miles long and extremely straight. Uh, this Malta Lake here isn't quite as long, but you can kind of imagine what I'm going to say right here. Wallace stood on a bridge over the river and placed two markers. One on another bridge at the same height, six miles away, and one halfway between the two bridges, again at the same height above the water. If the Earth were flat, when looking, looking through a telescope, the markers would be a straight line. And if the Earth were round, the middle marker would be noticeably above the marker at the end. The latter case is what he observed. I have a Polish globe to demonstrate the next point. So we have like Brasilia here and a bunch of other uh, similar but often different names. So one of the points I wanted to bring up is do we really know for sure, if you do a local measurement of curvature, that that actually means that the Earth is round, if you get some positive curvature? If you get a local measurement that claims the Earth is flat, does that actually mean the Earth is flat? And we have to be really careful about this, because we're making an assumption that whatever measurement you make locally applies globally as well. Now, to demonstrate this, let me kind of break the fourth wall a little bit here, and I'm going to use my notes that I've been walking around with for today's video, and we're gonna pretend that I folded this correctly and this looks like an infinite cylinder. So if you do some measurements in this part of the Earth, you're gonna have curvature in both directions and it's gonna look like it's a, a sphere, but let's say you live in this hypothetical infinite cylindrical part here, you're only gonna have curvature in one direction and it's gonna look like you live on a cylinder. And this can also happen, like, if you live, like, in a valley, you might get a totally different expectation of what the Earth looks like than somewhere else. Now, this assumption is basically that whatever happens locally is the same thing that happens globally, and there haven't really been any exceptions found to this in all the years of doing science so far. This is one of the reasons why it's very important to be able to replicate your experiments in science under different conditions because you can make some local measurement and it might differ somewhere else if you change the parameters in some sort of way. So certainly it's much more convincing with this type of experiment if you make this in many, many different places and you get the same result. It's not the same as sending a bunch of satellites buzzing around and just looking. Now, I have a bunch of time because Dylan is six time zones west of me and there's this cool roller coaster here on the lake and I'm gonna check that out and show you guys the sunset while we're waiting for Dylan to get ready for the online meeting so this is kind of a cool roller coaster because we can use this to control the speed and we can go as fast as we want we'll slow down a bit look at the nice view from here to see the curvature of the Earth from here.
everyone, I just got back to my apartment in Princeton. I'm gonna hop onto a Zoom call with Bill real quick and we're gonna discuss the curvature experiment. So we're here with Dylan now and Dylan's gonna to explain to us what some of the problems were with this experiment that Patrick did. And it'll be interesting to see, it's actually both consistent with the flat and with the spherical Earth. Yeah, so the experiment that Patrick had devised uh, was actually very similar to the old Bedford River experiment. Uh, we set a landmark, in this case, Stark and Ginn Hall. We shoveled 19 miles away. Uh, and then we looked back at those landmarks using a telephoto lens uh, where we were at the same elevation as the base of the buildings. Uh, so given the math that we had done on the curvature, uh, we should have expected to see 240 feet of obscuration, uh, but you know, clearly we can see most, if not all, of both buildings. Uh, even though Stark Hall is 226 feet high and Ginn Hall is 270 feet high. So does this prove that the Earth is flat? Does this kind of throw out 2,000 years of science? So I recommend everyone just pause the video for a few seconds and think about it and see, can you come up with a problem with this experiment? We're going to continue on and Dylan's going to give us some details now. Yeah, so let's revisit this curvature computation, right? What assumptions did we make when we were deriving these figures? Uh, so what we did is we assumed that the Earth was a, a sphere with a radius of approximately 4,000 miles. Um, and in particular, we assumed it was exactly a sphere, right? That there were no mountains or troughs or any kind of terrain uh, variation. Um, and so over still or uh, you know, very slowly moving water, this is a valid assumption. So in the case of the Old Bedford River, right? Um, and that's because gravity pulls water down to form what's called an equipotential surface. So for example, if the Earth was just a giant you know, ball of water, uh, it, it would be exactly spherical, ignoring things right, like tides from the moon or, or waves. Um, right? But over solid terrain, you know, we, we can have mountains and we can have valleys. Several people commented either on the YouTube video or one of the Facebook posts that there is in fact a valley between these two points. And I want to emphasize that that's not enough information to actually conclude that the experiment is invalid. We need to actually check the details of how far it goes down and when and do some trigonometry. So I'm still going to mention some of the people that made these comments in the description of the video and Dylan's going to give us more details of this situation. Here we have a map from the U.S. Geological uh, Service. We have uh, our two points, uh, Ginn Hall and Prosper. So Ginn Hall is at a latitude longitude of 33.2294 minus 97.1277. And our location in Prosper was at a latitude longitude of approximately 33.2215 minus 96.7994. I've marked 20 equally spaced points uh, between these endpoints and uh, gotten elevation data uh, from this U.S. Geological Survey. Now we do need to be a little bit careful here, uh, and that's just because putting a straight line in between two long points is not actually going to be a straight line over the surface of the Earth. It's going to be very slightly different in this case. Uh, because we're on such a small scale, it's really not going to make a difference, uh, but over larger distances this can be uh, a big factor. Now we need to break out some trigonometry. I've drawn a diagram of our setup in paint. Definitely, it's tempting to make fun of Dylan's drawings, but I know that mine are far worse and any of my students can attest to it. <laughs> They're completely illegible in comparison. Yeah, so what we have diagrammed here, uh, this black curve is sea level. This blue curve is the terrain lying above sea level. We are observing from this point on the x-axis, looking straight at this bright red point, and that's casting uh, basically a shadow to this maroon point. So anything below this maroon point here on this segment is going to be blocked by the curvature of the Earth. So our goal now is to determine what this distance is. Now for that, I have plugged the formulas and terrain data we got from the USGS into Mathematica. And what we see is that actually these numbers for every single point are negative. So there, there is no blockage from the curvature. It's actually lying below uh, sea level. And so we wouldn't expect to see any obscuration due to the curvature of the Earth. I've done enough travel recently that I owe a lot of people cat sitting from them <laughs> taking care of mine. So, and it's 1.30 a.m. now, so I really need to go and feed a couple cats. So we're gonna sign off. See you around. It's really way too cold outside now for August and we have a whole week of rain coming up. So I'm gonna sign off for now. Of course, stick around on the channel. Uh, probably no more flat earth. I think that's it for now. Um, adventures from the country of Georgia coming up. And so I'm gonna go find these cats. 
I'm gonna feed them, pet them a bit, and then I'm gonna go to bed.